This week's Parsha finds Jacob running for his life to Padan Aram to hide away from the wrath of Esau. On his way, he stops in an unnamed place, makes a pillow out of rocks, and dreams the dream of the ladder extending to the heavens. The narrative tells us nothing about the location at first. All we know is that there are rocks there, just as there are all over Israel. In the dream, he has a word from Jehovah, and when he awakes, he exclaims, Surely Jehovah is in this place, and I did not know it. Western society has lived so long with monotheism that we do not take into consideration other world views. We might talk about some remote tribe at the end of the earth that worships creation, but we do not realize that in the time of the forefathers, the culture was similar, and we have in the Bible other evidence of the mindset of pre-monotheistic people. Jehovah does not even declare himself to be the God of the Israelites until the book of Exodus. It seems like Abraham the Hebrew was the first human to have a personal relationship with the God of the universe, thus, by faith, becoming the first monotheist. But later, in Exodus 6.3, we read of this interchange. Jehovah is talking to Moses. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of El Shaddai, but by my name, yud heh vav -Hey, was I not known to them. Although the name Yehovah appears throughout the book of Genesis, there seems to be coming a transformation of the understanding of who the Most High really is. As El Shaddai, he is the provider of everything to each man who knows him. But now the people will see that he rules over all the nations and the other small g gods as well. So perhaps it is not surprising that Jacob is not prepared to expect Jehovah to be with him in this journey away from home. He anoints the pillows to mark a sacred place, and now we know where he has been. He calls it Beit El. Some people say Bethel, but there is no TH sound in Hebrew. And we learn that formerly it was called Luz. Beit El means the house of God, but the meaning for Luz remains uncertain. The place seems to have been somewhere between Jerusalem and Shiloh, as Jacob makes his way towards modern-day Syria. It is mentioned throughout the books of Genesis and Joshua, as is its former name, Luz. Further evidence of Jacob's lack of understanding of the scope of the omnipresence of Jehovah is shown in the next few verses. Genesis 28, 22-21 and Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If Elohim will be with me, and keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on, so that I may come again to my father's house in peace, then shall Jehovah be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be Beit Elohim, the house of God. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth to thee. There are other places in scripture that point to the idea that the gods are according to geographic regions. We find the story of Balak, the Moabite king, and Bil'am, the prophet for prophet. When the two finally meet in Numbers 22, Balak takes Bil'am to Kiryat Chutzot to curse the Israelites. Bil'am makes sacrifices, but he fails the king by blessing the people instead. Then the king brings him to the field of Tzophim at the top of Mount Pisgah, and Bil'am repeats his blessings. Now they proceed to the top of Peor, and the scene is repeated. Balak shoes Bil'am away, yet Bil'am prophesies in the Israelites' favor a fourth time. Why is Balak going to all this expense? Why does he keep schlepping the prophet around? They have traveled far, gone up and down many hills and mountains. They have sacrificed forty-two. Yes, 42 animals. Each time, Bil'am reports that he must give the prophecy which Jehovah has spoken. Yet Balak, the pagan king, keeps looking for a place where Jehovah does not rule. His worldview dictates that no god rules everywhere, and that there must be some place where his god can get the advantage over the other. Regrettably, his experience does not lead Balak to change his worldview. On the contrary, in great fury, he blames Bil'am. He is delusional, pitting himself against the Almighty. The king says to the prophet in Numbers 24, 11, 
Therefore now flee thou to thy place, I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, Jehovah has kept thee back from honor. Another example of this phenomenon is found in Second Kings seventeen, twenty four through twenty eight. The background for the story begins in verse six. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria, and placed them in Hala and Chabor by the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. The northern kingdom is no more, and, as was the custom of the Assyrian regime, they brought peoples from other parts of the empire to come and dwell in the lands of Ephraim. From verse 25. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there, that is, the foreigners who have just come in, that they feared not Jehovah, therefore Jehovah sent lions among them, which slew some of them. The new inhabitants of Samaria contact the king of Assyria and request that a local priest, originally from the area, be sent to train the people in the rituals for appeasing what they perceive to be the local regional god. However, as you read on in the story, you find that it was to no avail. We now have millennia of learning and experience with the concept of there being only one God, one creator, one ruler, one source of authority, one supreme being, one mighty one over all, one elevated one above all. We know that he is not only omnipresent everywhere, but also omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and omnificent, creating all. The Bible teaches that he is transcendent, outside of time, eternal, and not subject to change. We feel far more knowledgeable on the subject than our forefathers in the faith. But do we really live any differently? Perhaps we do not doubt that Jehovah will travel with us out of state to Thanksgiving dinner, but in which we regionalize our lives, separating pieces of ourselves for different standards. We imagine that he is the Lord of our spiritual life, but forget to look to him as ruler in our secular activities. Perhaps we feel sure that Jehovah will favor us with a promotion at work, but we are unsure whether he will prosper our children. Perhaps we can be extremely honest with our spouse, but we feel like it's okay to tell a white lie to a distant relative. We are good with eating clean according to Torah, but do not regulate our chocolate intake. We can believe Jehovah for the great big things, but stumble in faith for smaller things. It is our desire to separate the good things we do from the things we know are wrong. Whatever the disparity, it reflects a dissociation, as if Jehovah were not the only one who rules over all of our life, all the time. Oswald Chambers has written something very profound in his book, My Utmost for His Highest. The devotion for July 1 opens, There is no heaven that has a little corner of hell in it. Yehovah is over all. Let us strive to be one integrated human being under his Torah and by his spirit.